guys. Welcome back to the lineup. Welcome back, everyone. We're super excited for today's episode. We have on Ian Johnson. He's a basketball player. He played one year at Oak Hill Academy, uh, went on to play Division One basketball at Davidson, and then went on to play professional basketball in Europe. Ian's a great guy. He's going to talk a lot about his mental health journey with OCD and the book he wrote to help those who are um, also struggling. And now we welcome Ian Johnson. Hey, Ian, how you doing? What's up, guys? Hey, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you. I'm happy to be on the show. I want to say before we get started how inspired I am by you guys and the, the stuff that you're doing. We didn't have these kind of shows or these kind of uh, education available when I was your age. And I'm just super grateful for what you guys are, are setting out to do. So awesome. thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. And we're uh, happy to share your story here. So if we want to jump in, maybe get started with your playing career, uh, spanning from high school into college and even your professional career overseas. Sure, yeah. So I think... Uh, most people start to get interested in my career when I tell them I transferred my senior year of high school to Oak Hill Academy, which is uh, you know, one of the most historic high school programs in the country. I was very lucky that I had a connection that, that allowed me to go. We, uh, we didn't finish number one. We finished number two in the, in the country, but we were, uh, you know, we were pretty, pretty good. We had nine Division I players on the team, and it uh, was a super challenging experience, and I definitely learned a lot and really helped me prepare for Davidson, which is where I spent my college years. Played four seasons there under the uh, one of the most respected high school or excuse me college coaches in the country, Bob McKillop, and had some um, great experiences there. And then after Davidson, I played overseas in uh, Europe for five five seasons. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, especially that Oak Hill. A lot of people associate Oak Hill with some great NBA players, and I know you played one year with Carmelo Anthony. If you want to touch a little bit about that experience for you, yeah, it was it was a really fun experience. The Carmelo also transferred in his senior year, and he uh, he obviously wasn't Carmelo Anthony, the NBA superstar then. He was just Carmelo, the guy from Baltimore who's supposed to be really really good, and uh, he was. Like, really funny like he's a really funny guy and he's you know because he keeps a good perspective and kind of sees sees and reads people really well and it was a lot of fun playing with him you know that's great that seems like an incredible experience playing with carmelo anthony and i'm going to relay this into my next question so how have you struggled with mental health as an athlete from you know your high school career and then further on and leading up to your book that you wrote about ocd mm -hmm. yeah for sure so uh, from a like a medical standpoint or the way that a psychiatrist would diagnose me would be OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, which I think we're going to talk about um, a little bit more later in the show in so a lot greater depth. But uh, you know, because this is um, not an OCD show and a mental health show, I want to just talk a little bit more about some of the other ways in which I feel I could have done things differently from a mental health standpoint. And so one mistake that I think we make when talking about sports and uh, mental health is that we tend to over identify our struggles with a specific mental order we, uh, disorder. We like to lump all our uh, struggles into one pile called mental illness. And I think it's, um, you know, even, even if they're the easiest way to label oneself or the easiest way to uh, you know, think about someone else, they're still part of a much bigger umbrella that we call general mental health. So if I'm talking about the ways in, the, in which I struggled in sports and the ways in which I think a lot of other athletes struggle, I think it's important to point out that I struggle from a, a general emotional standpoint first, from like from a, a lack of education standpoint first. And so at, um, you know, at some point in my career as an athlete, I kind of just got lost in the system of sports and I didn't really have a, a strong emotional foundation on which I could rely to help myself through the pressure and the, uh, you know, the identi identity changes that came with that. And I didn't, in other words, know how to keep perspective or to stay grounded. And uh, a lot of this, I think, was just because I wasn't educated in the right ways and I didn't know about mental health in any capacity. Um, so I mentioned the summer before my senior year of high school. and. Uh, you know, in the span of a few months, I went from playing for a pretty good local team to playing for a, a the number one high school team in the country on a national schedule and playing against like thousands of fans. It was a, a very drastic shift. And that, uh, you know, same summer, I played really well in a few AAU tournaments and uh, started getting some scholarship offers. And this was like really great. And it was exciting. And I was like, I was glad that all this was happening. But, uh, you know, these coaches started calling and sending letters every day and 
uh, and I was like, holy crap, like, why are these grown men calling me like this? And it's like this entire new world of basketball was presenting itself. And it, uh, in addition to being the like amazing thing that it was, it was also extremely confusing. And, um, you know, like people kept saying like I was on the verge of blowing up, and I like I had no idea what that meant. And if someone had told me that means you're you're like, going to become, uh, you know, like a better player, then that, it would have been a lot easier to handle. But like when when people would tell me that, I kept thinking of the movie Clueless, which is I think is before your time. But there's a scene where one guy. Like in the 90s, it was cool to say, it's the bomb. So when people say, like, you're blowing up, I just think of that movie Clueless. And that's the only way I could, you know, kind of process it. Um, and I want to make sure as I, as I talk here that no one gets me wrong. Like, I'm incredibly grateful for the experiences that I had. And, uh, you know, I would definitely do it all over again if I could. But I would do it again with, like, the education and, like, the of my mind and of the system that was that was in place. And so when I talk like this, I'm really just trying to help reach people that might be going through the same thing and which is also why i'm so grateful for your podcast but uh you know just to finish the story like at, at some point i began to feel like i really needed to play well because that was the only way that people would like me and uh, you know playing well simultaneously or as a result of that became the only way that i could really like myself and that's obviously not the healthiest mindset for an athlete to be in or a human being to be in I didn't really have a healthy way of handling the pressure or handling the shifts in my identity. And that was when the OCD symptoms really started to ramp up, like unable to express myself in a normal way. The OCD symptoms kind of took, uh, took over and I'd experienced OCD symptoms for a number of years, but uh, it was more when like, what you might call the realness or the, the pressure of basketball took over that these symptoms, you know, just really, really boosted, uh, yeah, I mean, you talk a lot about education. I think that's a huge point and something that I think is changing in athletic departments that, you know, in, in today's age. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, did they have any resources at Davidson or at Oak Hill or, you know, what are some ways that you would recommend pushing that education or how that could maybe change in society? Yeah, so, at, uh, you know, Oak Hill is a, is a great school and like they really care about their students. And, you know, Coach Steve Smith and his wife, Lisa, were amazing, loving and caring people. And at Davidson, I really love my teammates and it's uh, a wonderful school and the administration is great and the coaches were great but at the same time like not not just at these schools but in uh, you know american culture global culture in general it's just the idea that of the, the uh, conversation or the dialogue around mental health just wasn't a part of part of it so i didn't if there was resources i like i i wasn't hugely aware of them, but that's just because it wasn't a part of the system in general. I know that's all changing now, and I'm I'm really grateful. Um, so the issue like per, wasn't exactly basketball or Davidson per se. It was, uh, you know, my uh, you know ability or inability to handle the pressures that basketball aroused. And uh, you know, if the most if the most important education we can have is our education of self, then I wasn't completely naive as to who I was, but I didn't exactly have an advanced degree in myself either. And uh, you know, I, I had no clue whatsoever what OCD was uh, and that there was a way to get help for it. And it wasn't, uh, you know, as a athlete back then, being in touch with your emotions was, you know, akin to, you know, the word they used often was like being a pussy. And so it was, no one wanted to be a pussy. So I just kind of kept it all to myself. Yeah, for sure. So going off of, what you said prior to this point about education, I want to talk a little bit about how you talked about, you know, self-identity with sport. That was a big part of our podcast a couple episodes ago. We talked a lot about associating yourself with sport and what that meant after the coronavirus for a lot of those seniors. But mm -hmm. I know that we're touching on here something else. We're talking about self-identity with living and dying by your performance, essentially. Mm -hmm. And a lot of athletes, myself included, will kind of associate their self-worth with their sport. And for me, especially going off of what you said, I this year, in the beginning of the year, I struggled a little bit to start the season. I started off a little slow, and I started identifying baseball, baseball, myself. Right? Yeah, so I got a little bit of a skid to start the year. Not Nothing huge. We didn't play that many games because the season got cut short, but not how I, I would have pictured it to start the season. And I started identifying myself with my sport, like, oh, if I need to get my, I need to do better, I need to be better for my team, or else my self-worth starts drastically going down. I started losing my self-image. I started getting a little bit of a mental funk. And 
So do you want to talk a little bit about strategies to get out of that mental funk when you're feeling down on yourself based on your sport? How did you get out of that? How did you realize that? So first, let me let me ask you what you did when you started feeling that way yourself. So when I started feeling that way, I started getting a little frustrated. I started replaying my performance in my head. I kind of started negative. I used to have negative self-talk, self-doubt. Like, oh, I got to perform here. I, I need to do this for my team. If I don't, my team's going to look at me a certain way or my team's not going to or I'm not going to be worth what I am for this team. Like what? This is my job. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do for the team. And it kind of just it bogged me down mentally where I was constantly analyzing every little piece of how I was playing and mm -hmm. trying to fix it in one swing or one at bat. Yeah, for sure. That's a uh, I, I relate to a lot of that. And when when I played, like I think at some point, uh, when you're a committed athlete, even if you're a student athlete, even if it, like you're only in the gym, it'd be four four hours a day, or on the field, baseball diamond, four hours a day. Derek, I don't know if you played sports either, but uh, uh, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you, I'm on the uh, golf team at Towson University, so a little nice. bit different, but a uh, similar experience. Yeah, I guess I should have guessed by that golf shirt. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, the uh, you know what I would do is I just begin to identify with the two or three hours a day that I was in the gym. So if I had a really good practice or a really good game, I was, I could feel good about myself. And if I had a, a really bad game or like a bad practice, or, you know, one of the coaches said something to me that I interpreted a certain way, then I would just ruminate on that um, for the next 22 hours until I was in the gym again. And I think the sign of a, a healthy athlete or a healthy human being is being able to process. If you read the, uh, I like to read biographies of certain athletes and listen to the testimony that the best athletes have. The best athletes in the world are super competitive and they really devote themselves to their sport, but they also have a way of like letting go and continuing to uh, you know, you know, process and move on to the next moment. So they, they want more than anything to be the best in the world, but they also have this firm foundation of themselves uh, apart from that. And I think that's something that sounds like you liked um, – I struggle with Ben. That's something that I definitely struggle with, with myself in terms of, um, you know, how to, you know, move on, move on from there. Ideally, that never becomes an issue. And that, uh, you know, if we t talk a little bit about things that we could do differently in the sports world, I can get into that. But ideally, when players play sports, they grow up and they develop, and then they never get to a point where they lose their identity. I think that starts with with what I was talking about earlier. The um, the foundation of self and the self-awareness and having a sturdy, um, you know, general emotional umbrella, if that makes sense. I think you bring up a great point there. And, you know, something that similar to me about, you know, a lot of people talk about finding an outlet from sports, something to do when you're not playing or something to help find your identity. And for me, like growing up, you know, that sports was always my identity. And then my story stems a little bit from injury and I faced an injury and all of a sudden that was my outlet. And then it's like, I have no outlet. And that was something I struggled with in my story. And it's something that now I kind of push for is your outlet should not be sports. You know, when you're struggling, it's not sports are great, but it shouldn't be, okay, I'm going to go do sports to get over it. You need to find a different outlet. And that's something I really learned from my story. And, you know, something that you touched on there that I really liked. Yeah. So I think it, it, you look at it like an investment portfolio with, with money. So if you are invest all your money in the stock market if the stock market takes a hit like your entire being is going to take a hit but if you have a diverse portfolio and you invest in some in stocks and you invest in some in uh bonds and you know this local business down the street and you put some savings away like you're always going to be or more likely to be prepared for whatever happens and i think being more well well-rounded in so many ways is just so healthy naturally anyway yeah yeah, that's a great analogy. That's a great analogy. And I know you talked a little bit about rumination. And I think for me personally, since I'm very open about my OCD and you talk about your OCD story, I don't know if the listeners know, but rumination is a very common symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder where people with OCD are constantly ruminating. So going into sport, that that could definitely be something that triggers it. Could be, oh, I'm ruminating about my performance. I know for me, when I was in high school, I would constantly wake up in the middle of the night and get up and feel out my swing, feel out my stance until it just mm. felt like perfectly right, until it felt right, and I'd go back to sleep. And in sport, yeah, that, that sounds like, okay, he's just practicing his rep. But when it starts getting to become a burden on your mental health and yeah, your perfectionist sure. personality and you're constantly doing that, that's a symptom of OCD. And mm. as someone with OCD, you have to like I have to recognize that 
And yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna really affect my play too much. But mentally, you just got to get out of that to free yourself and let your play let yourself play a little looser. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, you know if, if you want, I'd, I'd love to talk more about OCD. It's like what what my thing is. And you mentioned like ruminating on your swing and so on. Like I definitely ruminated myself. My my, my ruminations were more like, is are people gonna like me? Like, or do people like my play? Or like, what are people gonna say about like my jump shot or stuff like that? So I, I definitely definitely relate. Uh, you know, so if, if you guys are okay, I'm gonna talk just for a couple minutes about OCD and the way that it uh, impacted my career. Yeah, please, pl please stop me if I start to sound like a, a textbook. But uh, you know, so o OCD in general obviously revolves around obsessions and compulsions. Um, obsessions are the intrusive, unwanted thoughts, and intrusive meaning that they just kind of seem to show up in your brain, and unwanted meaning obviously that you don't want to have them. And these aren't uh, you know pleasurable thoughts. This isn't you thinking of yourself on a porch. Uh, you know, watching a sunset with a nice tea. This is, uh, you know, really often really weird or confusing or scary thoughts, very outright terrifying thoughts. And uh, you know, even when they're not weird or scary, there's just sometimes just the repetitiveness can be, become scary on its own. So like one of the OCD, what I call the more, my more benign OCD symptoms is that like I'll listen to a song and that song will just get like stuck in my head. So like, sometimes I'll hear some like Christmas carols in December and then in June or July, like I'm still humming the Christmas carols. And it's just, it's it's uh, it's not like an awful thing, but it's like the, just the constantness of it in my head is is really challenging. And uh, you know, these obsessions naturally cause a lot of anxiety and stress, and especially when we don't know how to recognize them. Um, and then the, the second part of OCD are the, the compulsions, which are the, things that you do or feel that you need to do to try to get rid of the scary and weird obsessional thoughts, the things that you do to try to get rid of the anxiety and the distress. So the, uh, uh, you know, the obsessional thought component of OCD is common to anyone with OCD. And, uh, you know, there are so many types of uh, obsessional uh, OCD thoughts. There's harm OCD, which is when like you fear you might stab someone you love in the heart, even though you wouldn't actually stab them. Uh, there's what they call homosexual OCD, which is when you have thoughts that you might be of a different sexual orientation than you actually are. Uh, there's relationship OCD, which is when you, you know, just have all these debilitating and really unhealthy thoughts about someone you're in a relationship with or about the relationship itself or yourself in the relationship. There's a, uh, help me out, Ben, religious oriented OCD, which is scrupulosity. Scrupulosity. Yeah, scrupulosity which is religion. And yeah, a lot of these OCD symptoms, this is, these symptoms or these types of OCD that Ian's mentioning here, these are purely obsessional OCD, but the name is a little misleading because when you say purely obsessional, you're not actually not performing compulsions. You're performing compulsions are just in your head where nobody can see them. So for example, if someone's going through, what is it, relationship OCD, they'll think, what if, what if I don't really love my partner? And that comes into your head and that's an innocent thought. And it usually fleets out. You go, well, obviously I love them. I'm dating them. This is why. But for someone with OCD, they have to keep reassuring themselves that they love them. Mm -hmm. So they can say, oh, I love them because I took them out to dinner that one night. It was really fun. I had a great time and we're here for each other. And then you'll feel really, really good about that for a while. And you'll keep replaying that same reassurance in your head until it wears out and you don't get that same positive feedback where you start doubting yourself again until you think of another thing. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a a loop they call it a, they call it a loop where you're constantly in doubt compulsion feel really good doubt anxiety compulsion feel really good and it goes in a circle and the more that you think about it that it comes back stronger and stronger every time and for a lot of people with ocd they'll have a main theme that they struggle with initially or they'll get caught on and that's really when for my myself that's when i went to therapy is when i got caught on a specific theme and, but after that, once you get better, it's my, my therapist talks about whack-a-mole where now your brain starts giving you little things, trying to mm -hmm. get your attention. What if this, what if that? So you have to use your tools you learned in therapy to counter that and get better. For sure. Yeah. You definitely brought up some good point. Like the obsessions vary and then the uh, compulsions vary too. And so the, um, you know, if we talk a little bit about the variance and the compulsions, like if you think of the movie Matchstick Man, do you guys know that movie? Might be before your time. It's with Nicholas Nick Cage. It's like from like the early 2000s, but 
in the movie, he's a, a, a germaphobe and he's an obsessive cleaner. And there are several scenes where Nick Cage is cleaning his apartment to within inches of uh, you know, his apartment's life. And that's a obviously a very stereotypical depiction of OCD, but that would be Nick Cage's character had these obsessional thoughts and the way that he wanted to get rid of those obsessional thoughts is by cleaning. Or if you think of the movie As Good As It Gets with uh, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson plays a character who uh, compulsively avoids stepping on cracks because he fears that if he does step on the cracks, something bad will happen. And uh, among many other quirks of his in that movie. And this is another OCD stereotype that uh, stereotypes that many people think of when they think of OCD. But even though they're depicted as like, you know, quirky in movies and they're actually you know, very real and debilitating symptoms and obviously I'm not trying to diminish them in any way. But uh, so if you, if you take like hand washing, germophobia, not stepping on cracks, uh, what these types of compulsions have in common is that they're manifested overtly, meaning that they're actual behavior. So if you uh, you know, wash your hands 150 times a day, that's an actual behavior. Or if you tiptoe down a sidewalk to avoid cracks, that's an actual behavior as well. And there are th like literally thousands or tens of thousands of uh, other overt symptoms that vary from person to person, like you said, Ben, the uh, different um, themes, you know, oftentimes you have different kinds of compulsions. Uh, you know, like one of my symptoms, overt symptoms when I played was that I avoid, avoided stepping on certain lines on the basketball court or like I tried to only post up on one side of the court and like when I played in Europe they would have the sponsors names like plastered in, in logos on the court and like one of our sponsors was a like a medical uh it was actually in Hungarian so I don't know actually know what the name of the thing was but I assume it was like a hospital or a like a drug drugstore or something and so like I fear that if I stepped on that logo then I would uh you know, get sick or get injured or something, or someone I love would get sick and injured. That's why I avoid stepping on that as much as possible. So that'd be like an overt way to avoid, avoid that feeling. But then, like you said, Ben, there's another uh, subset of OCD, which is often called pure OCD, in which the obsessions and compulsions are you know, confined to the, the mind. Um, and I think you did a good job of, of explaining that. Thank you. And yeah, those are the toughest almost to identify because Nobody can see you doing those compulsions. So when I opened up to my family, everyone was like, what do you mean you're you're struggling with this? For and sure, I said, yeah. yeah, well, you know, mental illness or mental health, sometimes when you're going through something, is invisible and you really need to be able to talk about it in order to get the help you need. Nobody can see it. You have to, in order to get better, you have to recognize that you have it and let yourself get better. For sure. A big thing. For sure, yeah. So one question I had, you know, once you came out with your story, like what, you know, we talked about some of the stereotypes and some of the way OCD is perceived in general society or in, you know, in the media, I guess you could say, what was kind of the response you got from some of your teammates, older teammates, you know, the general public being that high athlete at a professional level, division one at a level, kind of what, what kind of response did you get from that? Yeah, I think the, the response was, was mostly really good. Like I'm, I'm grateful that I've, uh, you know, my, family was supportive and my old teammates were, I was, I think, very confused. It's something that I never really shared with with uh, anybody. And like uh, like Ben, like I experienced a lot of pure OCD. So I was able to hide so much of my, um, so many so many of my symptoms and so, so much of the way I was suffering. So I think I took a lot of people, uh, you know, by surprise. I remember that when my book came out, like I, I did my first event and it was like with like a hundred people that like I knew everyone, and they, but they didn't know this side of me that they were going to hear. And I was just so terrified to, to share this with so many people. And uh, But you know, I think there there is and continue, will continue to be a, a huge amount of confusion until like this these kinds of conversations become the mainstream and until young people can grow up in, uh, in an environment in which they're educated on their minds in the, in the right ways. But uh, it was... Uh, it's definitely, you know, there. All that being said, and like all the the love and support that I've um, experienced with people I know and love, it's it's definitely rearranged a few friendships that I've had with with people, and it's. Um, I'm not gonna say it's all, you know, butter and cream. It's, it's you know, sometimes a little you know, crags in the salt too. So, but yeah, for the like, I'm so glad that I've was able to speak out and. and so glad that you guys are help, helping spread the message. Thank you. Thank you. So another question that I want to talk about 
is male athletes, men in particular in, mental, in the mental health field or the mental health, where men, I know that women but this is the same thing, but for men, it, sometimes it's very, very hard to talk about our feelings because since we've been kids, we've thought about, you know, masculinity, like be a man, be tough, don't like, keep it inside. And I think in sports in particular, that could dam- put a damper on people's careers or people's mental well-being, men in particular, because of this vulner- this masculinity that's always talked about. What do you think as a society we can do to help men be able to openly talk about it? So I think, uh, you know, the first thing is like this this kind of podcast is, is great. We're three men and we are sitting here talking about our feelings. And I think the conversation is already starting to change. Like the stigma is, is definitely going away. And we have, uh, you know, all kinds of prominent athletes coming out and talking about their experiences. Kevin Love being the uh, kind of the face of mental health for the NBA, DeMar DeRozan being super courageous. And the, uh, you know, but it's a, the toxic max, max, masculinity, excuse me, is an idea that's been ingrained in human culture for generations. Uh, and so to be able to rewrite the genetic code, the, the mental code, the you know mental literature, the literature of sports overnight is not going to happen. And so what I think we have to do is just, is just keep uh, finding the courage to, to speak our individual truths and keep educating our young people, uh, our young athletes and you know, general human, human beings that, you know, it's, you know, paradoxical, but the more you let yourself out and the more you are yourself, the better athlete you're going to be. I think it's a, a like one of the sadder misconceptions about mental health and sports is that like, if there's this idea that if you are like this very stoic and very closed off, aloof, uh, angry, competitive guy, that you are going to be a better athlete. And, you know, when you're on the court, you, you definitely want to be competing at your highest level and, uh, you know, not showing weaknesses and so on, but off the court, you will be a better athlete if you are able to tap into your vulnerability, if you're able to tap into your weaknesses, because you are getting to know yourself uh, better. And the better we know ourselves, the better we can be in whatever avenue we go forward into. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, really just being vulnerable, I think, is a big point. And, you know, Marcus, we had on last show, and he talked about just putting your ego aside and realizing that, you know, I'm human, I'm allowed to experience things and I'm allowed to feel things. And I think that's a big point. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I'm, I'm a division one athlete or I'm a professional player. You know, I, I can't come across as weak or what, what kind of reaction is that going to get? But, you know, like you said, you just got to experience it and everyone experiences it and, you know, it's a five and five issue and, you know, coming out and talking about it, I think is the biggest way to, to move forward. And like you said, make a change in society. Yeah. And I would uh, just, I would say, you know, move your ego aside in the right situations, but just to, don't buy, I'll say meet your ego and like see why do I have an ego because a lot of times our ego is uh, defending against something and so just learning to get to know all parts of ourselves is, is important. Yeah, so um, moving forward a little bit, I, don't, I mean feel free to keep talking about OCD if you had anything else to say, but I'd like to hear a little about your book and kind of what prompted you to write that and you know talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, so uh, you know when it came to like playing sports and we talked a little bit about identity in a, a, a previous question. Like I kind of handed over my, I really don't like this word, but like my soul, just, I can't find a better one. My soul to the, to basketball somewhere along the way. And then when I retired from basketball, basketball didn't you know, give my soul back, so to speak. Um, so what I mean by that is, is that at some point in my career, my identity as a human more or less merged with my basketball identity to the point where those two identities were largely indistinguishable. And you know, as we talked about earlier, I needed basketball to feel human. I needed basketball to feel good about myself. I needed the approval of others uh, in order to feel like I was worthwhile. Uh, and the way I earned the approval of others was through through basketball. I didn't have a sense of myself away from the game or any sort of real self-initiative uh, away from the game, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I didn't know what to do if a coach didn't tell me what to do. And then as a uh, as when I uh, quit playing basketball, I was 27 years old, and um, you know, as someone not playing the game anymore, I, I, I just didn't have a sense of identity. I didn't know who I was. Like I was just com- completely lost. It was like someone had always handed me a script to read, to read my lines throughout my life, and that script revolved around basketball. But then I wasn't playing basketball anymore. That script was taken away, and then I had to you know, kind of make my own way in the world. And 
uh, you know, despite having a, a really great education, like Davidson was a great school. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Like I had, uh, like I knew on paper what I could do. It was just like the, the internal journey was, was, was very stagnant. And so, um, you know, what I did was kind of, um, and I'm very lucky that I had the um, resources and the time and the motivation to kind of get that education, which I I'd never gotten, uh, you know, earlier. And so the um, the most important thing I did along the way was to commit myself to the therapy. And I'm you know incredibly grateful that I had two really good therapists who um, you know were seeing me. Just just like there are all kinds of uh, coaches out there, there are simply all kinds of therapists. And so again, I'm just very fortunate that I had good therapists. And then. Um, you know, I learned how to express myself in words. I had a uh, got a, a verbal narrative of my life, and then I learned how to let go emotionally. Um, and then, like, I, I started to read, you know, books in a new way. Like, I traveled to all kinds of faraway places just to get away and like see who I was there. And then I learned how to practice, excuse me, mindfulness. And then even things like learning how to contemplate my own mortality, which I think is like when we start to think about death, it's like really, free, it's really liberating, freedom and freeing and um, you know, helps us learn how to live and then uh, learn how to become a better listener, learn how to become a better friend, a better partner, stuff like that, and, you know, sleep and diet. And so then the book is kind of like the, I didn't, I didn't actually write it to get published. It was more like a journal exercise to help, uh, you know, just to help me process and to help me to figure out where it was. And then, um, you know, uh, the, editor of this uh, publishing place in New York read read one of the chapters and liked it and then that's kind of how the book book came out does that, does that make sense that's yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense I know that a lot of people through therapy or through to help themselves will journal I said it in the first podcast when you write something down you're thinking about a thought and then when you write it down you're looking at it and it's you saying it but reading it back in the third person can really open up eyes it can see sure. it from another perspective on the paper which is so essential to, you know, getting better as you're going through your mental health journey. Yeah. One of my uh, favorite authors is Zadie Smith. And she's, she always says that she writes so that she doesn't sleepwalk through life. And I think that's, that's a great way to put it. I think writing is also a big part, you know, people who aren't necessarily ready to come out and share their story in the public, but writing can be a great way to, you know, let it out from your inside for sure. Yeah. And feel that kind of release. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to go into a little bit about coaches and mental health with your coaches. So when you were going through your OCD, did you talk to your coaches at all? Did you let them know what was going on? Mm -hmm. Once you were able to open up, you never, you never talked to your coaches. I mean, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I, I had a lot of former coaches. I think a lot of them have read the book, but the, uh, like never as a player, I didn't, I didn't even know I had OCD as a player. So it's hard to talk to someone about that when yeah. I didn't know. And then, uh, you know, see the when my book came out, and uh, you know, yeah, have, no, I've had and, and continuing to have some conversations with former people, and it's, you know, it's obviously there if they want it. And, like no one, no one has to read the book, so it's, it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, you talk a little bit about identity and kind of how that journaling and how that publishing kind of helped you find your identity and how that shaped your life but going forward and one thing we like to do on the podcast is kind of give advice to people out there who are listening who maybe don't know what to do or are looking for some advice so what advice would you maybe give to seniors or maybe not even seniors but anybody who's thinking you know sports are going to end after college and what am I going to do what is my future going to look like you know or some of the experiences you had about that prompted you to that and what advice would you maybe give for people moving forward I think uh you know the as I've mentioned a few times, like the most important education we can get is like our education of self. Like we, um, I, I bring up this point a lot and I'm just going to bring it up again here is that, you know, we, when we go to school, we learn about like geometry and we learn about science and we learn about all these, all these different subjects, but they, uh, we kind of shy away from learning about like shame or rage or, uh, vulnerability and uh, like which which tools are going to help us in anything that we do in a line it's it's the latter and so the um, advice to other people is you know learn learn about yourself 
And then the, the more we learn about ourselves, and the more we love love ourselves, and we can, uh, you know, help others, and we can become a better listener, and we can be a better partner, and we can love other people better. It's kind of like you take it. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, "You keep up, so you can be kept up." So, if like if you, you know, take care of yourself and you, um, you know, treat yourself right, then you will be kept up, and you will be able to help others uh, much better. So, and that's obviously really hard for for students like you guys who are, uh, you know, managing a course load and doing podcasts and uh, playing sports and doing all, all this other kinds of stuff. But if, if you can find a way to, to um, you know, devote some time to journaling, like you mentioned, Derek, or uh, you know, going to see a therapist once a week or reading a book about something that is bothering you, then I think that the benefits of that just really start to take effect. Yeah, I think reading is something that helps me a lot when I'm going through something. For example, I read I read a lot of self-help books. I, re- I When I was going through my OCD journey, I read, I don't know, five, six books on OCD just to understand what I was going through. And then after I got through that, I still read books now to, for self-help because that you're right, in school, they don't teach you about this kind of stuff. They don't teach you about like self-worth, self-identity. So I've been reading a lot of books. If anybody listening wants to get any recommendations for self-help books or self-identity books, I can recommend you some that are great, that have helped me a lot identify with myself. Like I'm reading some right now that have really opened up my eyes and it's going to make me a better person moving forward. Yeah. I think a, a big part about that is being proactive with education too. I felt like in my story, you know, I dealt with injury and a lot of my education came with being reactive to what happened. And I felt very unequipped for when the situation actually did happen. It was like, well, what do I do now? And I think something that I kind of push and something that I think is very important is to be proactive on educating and learning about yourself so that, you know, if you face a struggle or if something happens, you know, you know how to deal with that. And it's not just, what do I do now? For sure. Yeah. Being prepared. Great point. Yeah. You talk a lot about mindfulness earlier, early on and something that I've, I recommend personally that I talk about a little bit in an Instagram post that I posted a few days ago is especially now with everything that's going on in the unknown, you can get lost in the, in the moment with the coronavirus, lost in uncertainty, kind of just taking a step back and breathing and, you know, meditating a little bit, re-centering re-center, yourself, re- resurfacing yourself, recentering yourself and letting yourself just be is a big thing to kind of reset and think about the moment. For sure, yeah. So uh, thinking actually further about your question, Derek, about advice, like if I, if I could give you know, recommendations, obviously therapy and, and taking care of yourself and so on, but like two other things, like uh, practicing mindfulness, whether that's through yoga or, or you know, sitting meditation is one. And then the second would be, uh, you know, learning to contemplate your mortality. I know that sounds so crazy, especially to OCD people who, you know, tend to you know, just fear death in a crazy way, but there's you know, a great app that's called We Croak, and it's a uh, it's based on the idea like in Eastern philosophy that only people that contemplate their death five times a day are going to be ha- uh, truly happy. And I'm not sure this is what you're looking for on your podcast for me to recommend, but like it, it's it, the app sends you a, a, a reminder five times a day that you're going to die. And so the uh, you know one thing I maybe one of my biggest struggles with OCD was that like okay. Like I was just, just fear of death and I had so many compulsions surrounding that. And once I learned to kind of embrace that, uh, that idea that it's, it's okay to think about and it's okay. I can still be scared, but I can still like, when you think about dying, it really kind of uh, helps you let go. So what this app does is like sends you a reminder five times a day that you are going to at one point perish. And then gives you like a, a kind of an inspirational quote that accompanies that message. And that's, uh, you know, my, my OCD self 10 years ago would have been like totally freaked out even just talking about this kind of stuff. But like, it's, it's, I wish I'd had it back then too. And just as a way to, to practice thinking. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think you talk about like embracing and, you know, just living in the moment. One quote that I always like is it, it's okay to not be okay. And it's all right to feel things and it's all right to struggle, but like just live it and experience it. And, and that's part of life. So that's for sure. Yeah. Well said. Another it's okay yeah, not to be okay. That's, that's great. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. I Another quote. Question. That's all right. <laughs> Another quote that I'm going to go by that I'm going to talk a lot about a little bit that kind of feeds off of the whole mortality thing and kind of letting yourself go and accepting, you know, uncertainty, accepting that inevitable and is you'll you'll never be uh, free until you free yourself from the prison of your own false thoughts. 
And that's, that's a quote that I really like because that's something that as people with OCD, we can really identify with that you really need to let go and accept it. And you'll never be free unless, you know, you accept these thoughts or mm-hmm. this uncertainty and just keep moving forward. And that'll free you. So from your mind. Yeah, for sure. Well said. Yeah. I mean, feel free to, if you have any closing thoughts, but we really appreciate you coming on in and uh, this was awesome to share your story. No, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to, uh, you know, share some of my thoughts and, and my passions with you guys. And uh, like I said, at the beginning of the show, you guys are super inspiring. You guys are in college and you're you know, taking the initiative in this way. And, uh, you know, I'm just super impressed and very privileged to be a part of part of your show. Thank you, Ian. It's been it's been fun. I really enjoyed this podcast as well as your talk in November at Washington College. That was really good as well. So I feel like this is a great way to reconnect and talk a little bit more about your experiences. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. And that was Ian Johnson. I'm extremely grateful to have Ian on this podcast. I've been pretty close with Ian since November when he came to speak at my school. And I'm so thankful for him to be able to openly talk about OCD and talk a little bit about the the themes because they are very invisible, some of them. So that was really cool. Yeah, he tells a great story, especially, you know, for athletes at the highest level, you know, playing Division One basketball and Oak Hill, like you talked about, and even overseas pretty um, professionally in Europe. For athletes like that to be able to come forward and tell their story is something huge. And he talks a little about self-identity from his book and really being vulnerable, which are topics, you know, that we talk a lot about and I think are very important to share. For sure. Moving forward, we're going to have Brandon Moore on our next podcast. Brandon's a close friend of mine. He, I went to the same high school as him for a couple of years. He's a track athlete at Northeastern University. He's accomplished in every asset of life. He's a Forbes under 30 scholar. He wrote a book called The New Lane. He's a great track athlete and an even better person. So he's going to come on and talk about his book, A New Lane, talk about his mental health journey from injury, getting back on the field, his mental health from that, and what that meant to him. Great. Looking forward to that. Thanks, everyone. Yep. See you guys.